The UFO animations in this broadcast have been seen and approved by eyewitnesses. Do you believe in flying saucers? It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. There's other life out there, and there's also intelligent life. But that doesn't mean it's easy to find. It's quite natural to wonder about our place in the universe. To suggest that we're alone is inexcusably egocentric. The federal government knows fully well what is taking place with regard to the UFO phenomenon. And they're not sharing that with the American people. I believe that the object that I saw was extraterrestrial. These objects would hover. They would dart very quickly one way or the other. I'd never seen anything like that. Haven't since then. If even one of these sightings is correct, is perhaps the greatest event in all of human history. Flying saucers? <laughs> I don't know whether to believe it or not. Hello, I'm Peter Jennings. We begin this program knowing from the research that most of us believe that we're not alone, that there is other intelligent life in the universe. NASA is searching for evidence of life in our solar system. Recently, NASA and the European Space Agency landed a probe on Titan, one of Saturn's moons looking for signs of life. The scientists at NASA would be happy to find a fossil, a microbe, anything to prove that life out there exists in some form. But tonight, there are millions of people here on Earth who believe that intelligent life from outer space is visiting us and they believe that they have seen the evidence. It was so shiny, it looked like someone was shining a very bright light on a piece of aluminum. The craft is disc-shaped, probably bigger than a 747, and it arced over the top of our car. Then there was a third object even behind the first two. So it came across and just stopped. It went back the direction it came from. This light went like this. <laughs> that forever gave me the, the view that something other than us was, was out in the world. There's no doubt that we're being visited. There is no doubt. They are definitely here. Why they're here, where they're from, you can only speculate. More than 80 million Americans believe that the Earth has been visited by extraterrestrials, visitors from outer space. And after a count of about four seconds, gone. We're probably missing... More than 40 million Americans say they have seen or know someone who has seen an unidentified flying object, a UFO. Object. I have seen alien vehicles on eight occasions since then. And many Americans believe that they themselves have been abducted by aliens. I find myself floating from my bed. Four of these beings came into my house, came in and got me. I know what I saw. I know what I experienced is real. I know it because everybody else has seen it, talked about it, and discussed it. So I know for a fact it's real. I know for a fact it's real. Real to some, fiction to others. Most scientists would rather look for life in a grain of sand than believe that aliens are here among us. When I look at the evidence that aliens have visited Earth, I don't find any of it compelling. None of it, I think, passes the rigorous tests of scientific evidence. So these patterns are made by the drawing. NASA scientist Dr. Chris McKay studies life in California's Mojave Desert, looking for clues to how life might exist on a dry, barren planet like Mars. Here in the Mojave, I know that there was life here. I can reach down in the soil and pull it up and analyze it and find evidence that there was life here when there was water here. I'd like to do the same thing on Mars. Scientists, including McKay, believe that the universe is so vast, there must be other places where life exists. If you look at all the people interested in life beyond Earth, there's scientists and UFO searchers. What we all have in common is a belief that there's life out there. We, we really have that commonality. The difference is how we approach what to do with that belief. 
What I do with that belief is approach the problem scientifically. So I don't disparage or ridicule the UFO phenomenon. I see it as, in a sense, a shadow of the same kind of work I do. The UFO phenomenon, only a shadow of mainstream science. But people throughout the world believe that unidentified flying objects are spacecraft guided by intelligent beings from beyond the Earth. I, I have no idea. I flash the light at it. And if you are among the believers, you have probably spent at least a few late nights listening to the program broadcast from this desert compound. Coast to Coast with Art Bell is the place to talk about UFOs or ufology as many of his listeners call it. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hey, Art. This is Matt in Colorado. Hey, Matt. Hey, um, got a sighting for you. It happened last summer. Oh? It was huge. It's cigar-shaped. It the so common cool. cause of ufology is to finally determine what in the hell is flying in our skies. It hurt your eyes, so I turned away. When I looked back, it's gone. I think that uh, Coast to Coast AM is the main conduit for ufology information. And um, over my phone lines have come the most informed ufologists, the best scientists, and some of the craziest people you'll ever meet. And I uh, was moving very slowly with the cloud cover. It, def and I, and it I definitely never, overflew New York City. Uh, and I never heard about a triangular uh, UFO until I looked it up and I found that you had seen one. Yep. And I Coast to I Coast the the began as uh, actually a political show, kind of like everybody else's uh, political show that radio is infested with. And one day I got sick of doing the same damn thing over and over again, the same politics over and over. And I, I, I began to sort of inject a little, well, a different kind of programming, you know, uh, aliens and... Three points of light. The weird thing about them... Coast to Coast became the fourth most popular program on American radio. It was really weird. Like they were doing a dance? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And huh. they went over the rooftop. I think we're fascinated with the whole concept of alien intelligence because it would be so strange if we were all alone. Imagine for a moment how it would feel if we were all alone, if there was no other life, other intelligent life, anywhere in all that you see out there. Art Bell and his wife Ramona say they encountered something from out there in 1994. We were on the way home from Las Vegas, about a half mile from where we're standing at the moment. I just happened to look out the rear view, the rear view mirror and just saw something coming up from behind us. And it looked like it it wasn't normal normal and I, I kept saying what what the hell is that and this thing floated above our heads doing about 30 miles That's a good an hour word, float. yeah. floated yeah it floated uh, or defied had to have been defying gravity or it was a lighter than aircraft I don't know but it was triangular it was monstrous the moon and the stars went away and there it was above us and we stood and watched it go across the valley and head toward the mountains Art Bell and his wife were alone, but there have been UFO sightings with hundreds, even thousands of eyewitnesses. Phoenix, Arizona, March the 13th, 1997. There were some incredible sightings over Phoenix called the Phoenix Lights, and they occurred while I was doing my program. I took call after call after call of people in Phoenix saying, oh my God, what's flying over our city? At 8.30 p.m. that night, hundreds of people reported seeing a mysterious flying something. Security guard Bob Nelson was sitting on his porch with his dog. And all at once, these six or seven lights came across the top of the hill, and it was moving very slow. And then I went in and jokingly said to my wife, we got a UFO coming over. She just couldn't believe what she seen. I mean, and of course, she didn't know what she seen. Sue Watson and her children, Brian, Aaron, and Kevin, were in their front yard. We saw this incredible-sized vehicle. There were five huge lights in the very front of it, and it was in a boomerang shape. I'm only a mile and a half from that mountain, the top of that mountain. That vehicle spent five to six minutes hovering from that mountain to my house. I don't know anything that can go that slow. It was absolutely silent, just completely 
gliding, just like part of the sky, just a big, big, big platform, just flying with lights in front of it. I could see it was covering stars, so I knew it was something, something solid. Sheriff's Deputy Thomas Chavez was in his squad car. I was sitting here facing to the east, watching the intersection. And on one of the times when I glanced up from my paperwork, that's when I saw the strange set of lights. I can't give you a definite answer as to what it was. All I can tell you of what it was not, and it was definitely not an aircraft, an aircraft as we know it. Mike Fortson grabbed his binoculars and went outside with his wife. As it passed in front of us, all we could see was the left wing of the craft itself. That's how low it was. We didn't go fetch a camera. We didn't do anything but sit there and watch it. You actually tell yourself not to blink because you might miss something. I mean, that's how intense it was. It gives me goosebumps when I talk about it. <laughs> At 10 p.m. that night, thousands of other people reported seeing another series of lights in the sky. What I'm looking at here is a light on South Mountain. Mike Kristen videotaped the event from his house on Moon Mountain. When I saw the one light, it was, it was one thing. I was just photographing the one light, and then all of a sudden another one popped up in a different direction. So then I trained the camera on that light, and then another one popped up. And before you know it, this whole thing is starting to happen in front of my eyes, and, and uh, I'm going, wait, this is something. <laughs> all right, you tell me what it is. Yeah, it's a James McGehey lives in Tucson, Arizona, which is south of Phoenix. He's a retired Air Force pilot and an astronomer. He is an outspoken skeptic about UFOs. Clearly, today, UFOlogy is a mythology that's based on superstition wrapped inside a fairy tale telling a story that's simply not true. What most people see is lights in the sky at night, points of light. They equate that to spacecraft from another world. There's no connection. If you see a light in the sky, you've seen a light in the sky. That's all you've seen. This happened in the case of the Phoenix lights. The lights on the videotape were simply flares being dropped by A-10s on the Goldwater test range. There's nothing mysterious about it. I know what flares look like. These are clearly flares. And some people have said they saw a triangular aircraft flying through the Phoenix airspace. The argument against that is very simple. The Phoenix radar didn't see anything. They were connecting the dots of these objects. That's all they were doing. The bright lights of these objects, they were connecting this and saying it's all one thing. It wasn't one thing. It was five different aircraft flying in formation. The people in Phoenix do not believe they were just connecting dots. For somebody to say there were planes in formation, I'm telling them I saw a solid object. My wife saw a solid object. I know 300 or 400 people that I've talked to saw the solid object in the 8 o'clock hour. I know what I saw, and it was something that I've never seen before and probably will never see again. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It was something that is not from here, and that's what's so intriguing to me about it, that it's unknown, the unknown of it. I am so certain at what I saw that I would testify in a court of law or in a congressional hearing as to what I saw, because what I saw was not an aircraft. I think it was a UFO. I be honest believe that there was a UFO. You don't have to believe me. Nobody believes it. But you'll believe it when you see it. When it comes to unidentified flying objects, seeing is believing. This is the Center for UFO Studies on the outskirts of Chicago. There are files here from thousands of witnesses who report seeing UFOs, and the records go back for decades. The best way to become a believer in UFOs is to have a sighting. If you encounter it directly, you're likely to believe in it because you encountered it. 
intellectual arguments don't always work as well with people, understandably. You know, I saw a UFO, so you should believe in it, or look at all these other people that saw it, so you should believe in it. It's always the personal that's going to lead to a belief that the subject is real, and that's true for scientists, for ufologists, and for members of the general public. Dr. Mark Rodiger has been researching the UFO phenomenon since 1974. One conjecture is that uh, many reports, or at least a good fraction of reports these days, are caused by secret aircraft. It turns out that it's actually pretty easy to distinguish between sightings that might be secret aircraft and sightings that are probably not that. When you get a UFO sighting where the object behaves in a way that defies uh, conventional physics, defies the way that an airplane would move, um, and when you can see the object, it's not just a point of light, but there is some uh, size there, some actual shape you can see, and that thing isn't shaped like an airplane, well, then it's not a secret aircraft. It's whatever it is, it's just something totally bizarre and strange. An example of that would be a sighting that occurred in uh, January of 2000 near St. Louis on the Illinois side of the river. This huge triangular object was moving fairly low to the ground, kind of zipping around the area. It's not Venus or Mars or whatever object was up at the time. It's not another aircraft that was up at the time. Well, gee, if it's not a conventional object, what else could it be? My name is Melvin Knoll, and I'm a part-time truck driver, and, and I own this miniature golf course and also the go-kart track out here. That certain morning, I happened to look over into the sky to the northeast, and I seen a very, very bright light up there, like a very bright star. And then I said, well, that's moving. And I just stood there and watched it as what it was doing, and it was just coming down out of the sky real slow, and no noise, just quiet, and I couldn't see no wings or nothing, just floating right through the midair up there. And I thought, well, if I don't tell nobody, that I've seen something go over town tonight. Nobody will believe me tomorrow. Noel drove his truck to the Highland, Illinois Police Department to report an unidentified flying object heading toward the neighboring town of Lebanon. Well, this is a huge call from Highland PD. Reference to a truck driver just stopped in and said there was a flying object in the area of Lebanon. It's a joke, right? No, this is not a joke. And out. Ed Barton was the first police officer to respond to the call. Advised, there's a very bright white light east of town, and it keeps changing colors. It's heading westbound now. Matter of fact, if the shadow officer looks up, they can probably see it by now. 2550. I see something, but I don't know what the heck it is. At 4.23 a.m., police officer David Martin saw the UFO over a field on the outskirts of Shiloh. I happened to look over and saw this large floating object that was just moving very slowly. It was probably about a football field in length. It had three large bright lights lighting up the sky underneath it. I honestly don't know what it was that I saw, other than I know it wasn't a plane or a helicopter or a blimp. Police reported the object over Lebanon, over Shiloh, over Milstad, over Dupo. Detective Mark Lopino says he saw it as it approached O'Fallon, Illinois. I was driving eastbound on Highway 50 when I see the object, the UFO, if you will. I first thought it was probably a bunch of helicopters flying in some type of formation. As I drew closer to it, I saw it start to cross over the roadway. It was unlike anything I have ever seen before. You could see the lights, and you could see something that they were attached to, and it was shaped like a, a triangle. I'm freaking out. I'm like, I, what, what the heck is this? So I continue, and it's going over these trees. By the time I get here toward the left turn lane, I duck into the left turn lane here, and I stop right about here. I wanted to listen to see if I could hear any type of engine noise. I could not hear anything. I tried to look again at the UFO, and it had already gone behind these trees. I put it in reverse to back up a couple seconds, 
to see if I could reacquire it again. By the time I backed up to try to see it, it had moved at least a mile away, if not further. That quick, I was just astonished. I didn't know what to say, I was speechless. Six people, including five police officers, saw an object over Southern Illinois that night. And they all describe what they saw as a massive triangular object flying in total silence. It very well could be an uh, alien ship. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess that's why they call them unidentified objects. You know, I don't know. I do know that it wasn't a plane that I've ever seen before. Am I saying it was an uh, alien spacecraft? No, I'm not saying it was a military craft. I'm saying I can't identify the object, and it's uh, an identified flying object by its very definition. There was no official investigation of the sightings in Illinois or Arizona. The U.S. government is not in the business of investigating UFOs. To understand why, you need to go back to the beginning. When we come back, the story of the first flying saucers. The fascination with unidentified flying objects can be traced to a day in June 1947 and to one man, Kenneth Arnold. He was not a guy who read science fiction. He was not a guy who had any occult interests. He was not a guy with a lot of imagination. He lived pretty close to the ground mentally, but he loved to fly. And so on the Tuesday afternoon of June 24th, 1947, when he saw these nine disc-shaped objects flying at some considerable speed over Mount Rainier, he thought that he was witnessing a secret military experiment. Every newspaper across the nation has made headlines out of it, and this afternoon, we are honored indeed to have here in our studio Kenneth Arnold, who we believe may be able to give us a first-hand account and give you the same on what happened. Go ahead, Kenneth. They looked something like a, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear. Uh, I'd be glad to confirm it with my hands on a Bible because I did see it. It's just as much a mystery to me as it is to everyone else who's been calling me the last 24 hours wondering what it was. The press referred to the nine objects Arnold said he saw as flying saucers. Arnold was such a straight shooter he was so clearly puzzled, there was no possibility that this guy was making up a strange story. Arnold's sighting just seemed to catalyze everything. All of a sudden, there was this presence of something unidentified in the sky that couldn't be ignored. And in the next two or three weeks, there were many hundreds of sightings. Army fighter planes are on patrol for flying saucers. Cameras installed to photograph them. So many objects were being seen in the sky by so many people that the Army Air Force launched an investigation. They're seeing flying saucers everywhere. And on September the 23rd, 1947, General Nathan Twining issued a memo that said quite categorically, the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. When it appeared that technological devices of some kind were penetrating American airspace and we didn't know what they were and had no idea what to do about them, this was obviously a national security problem. It was the beginning of the Cold War and what Americans feared most was being attacked by the Soviet Union. We didn't know what they might have flying. And so those concerns by the government, legitimate concerns by the government for our security, led eventually to them establishing a full-time office uh, to investigate UFOs. The Air Force investigators quickly came to realize that they were not dealing with Soviet aircraft. Nothing man-made performed like flying saucers. They started thinking, well, if the Soviets aren't doing this, there's really no thing on Earth that can be doing this. And then on July the 24th, 1948, two experienced commercial pilots, Clarence Charles and John Whithead, were flying at night over Alabama when they encountered what they described as a cigar-shaped object, perhaps 100 feet long, flying faster than any aircraft they had ever seen. It had, they said, two rows of windows, and they could see lights inside. 
and orange-red flames shooting out of the tail. Air Force investigators couldn't explain it. It could not possibly fly unless it had an engine in it that was beyond anything anybody on Earth could make. And this, in a sense, was their proof that they were dealing with the extraterrestrial technology. The Air Force investigators trusted the testimony of these experienced pilots and were forced to consider the incredible. Since 1948, there have been thousands of sightings by commercial and military flight crews. March the 12th, 1977, I was flying a trip from San Francisco to Boston now stop in a DC-10. It was an Airbus 320, and we had 24 passengers on board with very good condition. We were at uh, 39,000 feet. We were north of, just north of Dallas-Fort Worth. It was a beautiful, clear night. Out of nowhere, some lights appeared, looking over to the left of me, just to the north of me. I noticed a red light of some kind to the far, uh, the distance off our, our port side, our right side. And Larry says, well, keep an eye on it. He says, well, now it's coming at us. <laughs> so. And they began a turn from pointing directly at us in an echelon sort of a turn away. It was not a plane. It was not a weather balloon. It was huge, absolutely huge. It was a dark red color. And so this object began to become transparent, and it disappeared. It it was absolutely crazy. <laughs> crazy. It just was gliding through the sky so quietly. And as it did so, it blotted out the stars behind it. And it just reminded me of a submarine in, a, in the depths when it's quiet and just kind of motoring right on through, you know? There were no wings. There were no windows. And uh, it was cigar-shaped. I saw what I saw. And this thing was not from here. I watched this big, gigantic light go out behind our left wingtip, and then as the turn progressed, it disappeared in the distance off to the back at a very high rate of speed. I've flown all the jets. I flew in the war. I flew B-17s in the war, everything. I've got over 30,000 hours of flight time and never had a sighting as that one. So it was once in a lifetime. In the fall of 1948, Air Force investigators were convinced by the testimony of pilots. In a remarkable top secret report to General Hoyt Vandenberg, the Air Force's chief of staff, the investigators said the Earth was being visited by alien spaceships. They took it so seriously that they risked their own careers by writing an estimate of the situation that they sent on to higher headquarters and said that UFOs some of these UFOs could be extraterrestrial, which, of course, was not received well by, uh, by the Pentagon. Hoyt Vandenberg looked at this thing and he said, I cannot accept this. I cannot accept this kind of conclusion because you don't have concrete proof that that's what kind of a device we're dealing with. The eyewitness accounts from experienced pilots were not enough for the general. The Air Force wanted the flying saucer phenomena to go away. But the popular fascination with mysterious flying objects was growing. In 1952, the Air Force received more UFO reports than any other year in history. The sky is the stage, the actors so-called flying saucers. And they're back on the scene with some new twists. This is a photograph of a flying saucer taken by myself and it reminded me of two straw hats stuck together at the brim. I saw an intensely bright white green object in the sky. Now, I wouldn't want to say that this was one of those so-called flying saucers, but whatever it was, it was an object and not an illusion. The Air Force had really tried to downplay the UFO problem. But by the summer of 1952, there was an enormous wave of sightings. There were hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of sightings. Most alarmingly, the sightings were focused on Washington, D.C. At least three radar systems in Washington in the area were picking up unidentified targets. 
this very much worried people in Washington because it looked like penetration of the most important airspace in the country. In July 1952, the Pentagon's communication system was overwhelmed by calls about UFOs. The number of calls of frightened Americans, hysterical Americans coming into the switchboards of the American government were clogging communication channels. And if American communication channels were clogged, then this would leave America vulnerable to a potential Soviet attack. So the task is calm the Fuhrer, end the hysteria. It was public hysteria, not the flying saucers themselves, that threatened the national security. President Truman ordered the CIA to make recommendations on how the Air Force should handle the UFO problem. The CIA convened a panel headed by the physicist H.P. Robertson. The Robertson panel says we must do something to remove the aura of mystery from the UFO phenomena so that people no longer take them seriously and don't bother to report them. That's what we want. So flying saucers, whatever they were, wherever they came from, were to be made the subject of ridicule. But it was impossible to control the public interest. The public was fascinated. One of the most widely read magazine articles at the time proclaimed, the flying saucers are real. One of the most respected publications in America, Life magazine, published photographs. Just a minute, ladies and gentlemen, I think something is happening. And then came the movies. The day the Earth stood still. This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. The but War of the Worlds. The meteors are the often ridiculed flying saucers are in reality the flaming vanguard of the invasion from Mars. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. Washington, London, Paris... Earth versus the flying saucers. The whole world is under attack. Can it survive? The government simply could not control the public's appetite for a phenomenon so intriguing. They're pulling us up. When we come back, the Air Force tries to explain the unexplainable. Prisoners hurtling through endless space. Today, if you ask the Air Force about UFOs, it will tell you there is no evidence that they are extraterrestrial vehicles, and there is no evidence that they represent technology beyond our own. The Air Force will cite as proof its own 22-year study called Project Blue Book. During the 1950s and 60s, Project Blue Book, based at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, investigated hundreds of UFO reports every year. They came from every part of the country, from people in every walk of life. Night sightings, day sightings, sightings of mysterious lights, structured craft. The reports came to Blue Book seeking answers to what it was in America's skies. Blue Book was overwhelmed by the volume of reports. Americans were told again and again, we have a crack unit of individuals, scientifically trained people, studying this phenomenon. That wasn't the case. There wasn't a massive institute where Blue Book had a staff of white-coated lab technicians. There was a, a guy at a desk and a secretary and a, you know, a private or someone there you know, typing stuff. It was a very, very small project. Colonel Robert Friend was the director of Project Blue Book from 1958 to 1963. We wanted to explain as many sightings as possible, but we recognized that the, the amount of resources that would be necessary in order to do this would have been far beyond those that we were ready to commit at the time. Blue Book was never intended to become a serious full-scale scientific inquiry the Air Force had another mission for its UFO office. Blue Book was tasked with a public relations mission, and that mission was denounce the UFOs, dismiss the UFOs, debunk the UFOs, and anybody who believes in them. Just come up with answers and get this UFO thing out of the newspapers. The best way to keep UFOs out of the newspapers and therefore out of the public mind was to say repeatedly that they were nothing more than weather balloons or rare atmospheric conditions, a star on the horizon, whatever it took. 
what they wanted to try to do was, I think, to re-educate the public regarding uh, UFOs to take away the aura of mystery. And that job was most often left to Blue Book's one civilian scientist, Ohio State astronomer, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. To this time, there is no proof that I would consider valid scientific proof that we have been visited by spaceships. There was not one sound. I listened. There was not a sound. In the Between 1948 and 1969, Dr. Hynek was Project Blue Book's lead scientific investigator on thousands of cases. His job was to stretch his imagination to try to find explanations for every possible case he could, even if he knew it didn't make any sense. Don't you think it would be kind of unusual for a meteor to just fall across the road and hover over there a minute? and then drop to the ground? The coming over wouldn't be bad, the hovering that still would bother me. The longer he was in, the more cases he saw, the more he realized that he couldn't explain the cases, and there was a genuine mystery involved here. In the middle of the Cold War, across remote stretches of the northern United States, the Air Force kept ballistic missiles and B-52 bombers on constant alert. On the night of October the 24th, 1968, at Minot Air Force Base in Minot, North Dakota, Airman First Class Mike O'Connor was dispatched to make a routine repair at one of the missile sites. We made our turn to come down the road to the missile site, and out of the corner of my eye, I observed a what I thought was a farmer's yard light, but it looked awful bright. Uh, as we proceeded down the road, the object appeared to lift off the ground and parallel us down the road until we came to the missile site, at which point uh, we got out of the truck and it just kind of hovered there. Staff Sergeant Bill Smith was in charge of security for 10 nuclear missiles. That night, he reported seeing strange objects. These objects would rise, they would speed up, they would slow it down, they would hover, they would dart very quickly one way or the other. We were just not really sure that these were things that we could explain. The Minot control tower diverted a B-52 to investigate. Captain Brad Runyon was the B-52's co-pilot. The air traffic controller asked us if we would mind going out to this one area and uh, looking for something. I was curious, and I said, well, what are we looking for? And they said, well, uh, you'll know it if you find it. The navigator on the B-52, Captain Patrick McCaslin, suddenly identified an object on his radar screen. I saw a return, faint one sweep, bright the next, large, off our right wing, 3 o'clock, at about 3 miles. And at that point, I asked the radar navigator, to turn on the camera, which would then take pictures of whatever was on the radar screen. These pictures of the radar screen show the object flying in formation with the B-52. This thing was climbing out with us and maintaining the same heading we were. That was unusual. But what really watered my eyes when was it when this thing backed away and allowed us to turn inside of it. When the object suddenly disappeared from the radar, the bomber turned back to find it. Co-pilot Runyon was the first to spot what appeared to be a glowing craft hovering near the ground. When things like that are happening, it seems like time just stands still. My estimate overall object was uh, a minimum of 200 feet in diameter, and it was hundreds of feet long. It had a metallic cylinder attached to another section that uh, was shaped like a crescent moon. I felt that this uh, crescent moon part was probably the command center. I tried to look inside the thing, but all I could see was a yellow glow. At that point, I was fairly sure that, that I was looking at an alien spaceship, something that had come here from some other planet other than the Earth. 
Co-pilot Runyon and the other crew members of the B-52 reported their sighting when they returned to the base. According to Blue Book's investigation, the crew of the B-52 and 16 witnesses on the ground said they saw a UFO that night. In its final report, Blue Book concluded that they were all seeing stars. None of those pilots saw a star. I know those pilots. I know what their training was. I know uh, how many stars they'd seen in the course of their careers, and they were not looking at a star. It bothers me that Blue Book blew it off. I don't think this, this um, incident has ever been adequately explained. The Air Force finally got out of the business of trying to explain UFOs in 1969. It closed down Project Blue Book after an independent commission concluded that UFOs were of no scientific interest. There was one loud dissenting voice, Blue Book's once skeptical chief scientist, Alan Hynek. After more than 20 years and more than 12,000 UFO investigations, Dr. Hynek had become a believer. In Blue Book, for instance, we would get reports from military pilots, and that was particularly embarrassing to the Air Force because after they had trained those men, and they couldn't very well, they could say that a civilian pilot might have been un untrustworthy, but they could hardly say that to their, of their own military exactly. pilots, and we got case after case after case from military pilots which never hit the press. The difference between Alan Hynek and the people he worked with in Blue Book was this. He was a scientist and they weren't. And he never forgot that he was a scientist. The Air Force paid his checks and paid him well. But they couldn't quell his scientific curiosity. And it was his scientific curiosity that finally won out. And that will, I think, probably at some point in the future history of science, will earn Alan Hynek a reputation as a courageous and principled man. Dr. Hynek spent the rest of his life investigating sightings and calling for a serious scientific inquiry into the UFO phenomenon. Most of his fellow scientists rejected his opinions. Dr. Alan Hynek failed to interest the scientific community in UFOs. At issue was the nature of the evidence. Ufologists argued that the sheer volume of eyewitness sightings is proof that something extraordinary is happening. But mainstream scientists categorically reject eyewitness testimony. I don't care how many people say they've seen something. They've seen the lights in the sky. As a scientist, I need something better than your eyewitness testimony. Because even if in the court of law, Eyewitness testimony is a high form of evidence. In the court of science, it is the lowest form of evidence you could possibly put forth. It doesn't matter whether it's President Jimmy Carter who saw a UFO, which he thinks he did, uh, you know, or Farmer Bob. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, everybody has eyes and ears and a brain that perceives and so on. Um, I think they're all equally unreliable as eyewitnesses. We're very bad at recounting things we think we saw. My husband and I were flying our airplane. It was at night, and we saw a light. We saw a bright light at 2 o'clock position. And it was one of those, oh, my goodness, kind of moments. Jack, do you see that? Yeah, I see that. And it's, it's, there really is a light there, right? And it's, it look, it's coming towards us, right? It was this, I know I'm seeing something. It's really there. And we, you know, we just sort of, we looked at each other, we said, this can't be happening to us. We can't be seeing a UFO. You know, we're so skeptical. But, but look, it's really there. And then clouds that we didn't realize were there spread apart enough to, for us to understand that what we were seeing was a piece of the moon, that it was just shining through a hole in the clouds. Things are often not what they seem. For scientists, seeing is not believing. 
For them, only physical evidence will prove that UFOs are visiting Earth. They do believe that life exists beyond Earth, and they have spent decades searching for the first piece of evidence. A spacecraft launched by NASA and the European Space Agency traveled billions of miles, and in January 2005, landed a probe on Saturn's moon Titan. No human spacecraft has ever landed so far from Earth. These images of Titan's surface suggest an active world of rivers and oceans. Scientists believe that where there is liquid, there may be life. If we look for life in our backyard, our cosmic backyard, if we look there and find life, imagine what that tells us. That some other random place that happens to be a nearby planet has life just the way we do. Then there's no telling how rich the entire universe is with life. There is still no evidence that the universe is rich with life but mainstream scientists think there has got to be life. There's more than 100 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. And there's more than 50 or 100 billion galaxies in the universe. You multiply these two numbers, that's a one with 21 zeros worth of stars in the cosmos. To suggest that we're alone is inexcusably egocentric. Somewhere among the billions of stars in our galaxy, or in the billions of other galaxies in the universe, scientists believe there must be other planets, just like Earth, where life exists. What created Earth and man must have created life somewhere else, they say, in the vastness of space. Somewhere, there must be another developed civilization trying to reach us. Dr. Frank Drake has been listening for 45 years. In 1960, in Green Bank, West Virginia, Dr. Drake first pointed a radio telescope at a nearby star to listen for a signal. We, we just had this feeling that something very important was starting, that this was a new road that human beings were taking that was going to lead to very wonderful places and very wonderful things for our civilization. Dr. Drake's experiment marked the beginning of a project called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Dr. Seth Shostak is an astronomer who works with Drake at the SETI Institute. We've been broadcasting our existence to the universe for the last 50 or 60 years, and, and we've been doing that with our high-powered radio and television transmissions. Every day, those signals just go right on out into space. That's how we're broadcasting this space, and we kind of turn that idea around when we try and find the extraterrestrials by trying to find their broadcasts. Dr. Drake remembers the day of his first search in April 1960. For all we knew, every star in the sky had a radio transmitting civilization. We might succeed the first day. We even had a tape recorder connected to the radio receiver so that we could tape record any voices we might hear from the other worlds. And so we pointed at the first star, and uh, when it finally set in the west, we moved over and pointed the telescope at the second star. And we heard on a loudspeaker a signal like we'd never heard before with a radio telescope. And it was a lot like a lot of people said we might detect a series of pulses. It sounded like choo, choo. all our hearts were pounding. You think, this may be one of the greatest moments in history unfolding right here before us. The signal turned out to be nothing more than sound from a passing plane. When you detect such a signal, and it truly looks to be extraterrestrial, it's a very special emotion. I'd like to feel it again. <laughs> After more than four decades, Dr. Drake has yet to hear an alien signal. Dr. Jill Tarter is another astronomer working at SETI. The chances of success in SETI are difficult to estimate. But if we never search, the chance is zero. So I think what we ought to do is search. 
sunset, you can see the telescopes. Oh yeah. The two, yeah. two shiny. Yep. Yeah, I see them. At Hat Creek in Northern California, SETI is building an array of telescopes that will search for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence on a scale never before attempted. The project is named after its largest donor, the co-founder of Microsoft, Paul Allen. All right, let's go. This observatory is sited in a very quiet pastoral valley, mostly cows and a few people. Um, it's going to change a whole lot when we put 350 telescopes in here, and it's going to change even more if indeed those telescopes detect a signal from someone else's technology. Of course, we don't know how many civilizations out there might be broadcasting signals that we could pick up. The faster that you can go through all that uh, heavenly real estate, uh, the sooner you're going to find a signal. And if that happens, this is where it will happen. It'll happen right here. This is, this is kind of the portal to the cosmos. This is the place where we're going to crack the crystal of isolation that has surrounded this planet for four and a half billion years. Right here, right here in amongst the trees and the lava and the, the bright sunshine. And drink a little champagne along the way. We will build it, and I hope they will come, or at least in the form of their radio waves. Some UFO believers belittle SETI. Why search the heavens for an elusive signal, they ask, when the extraterrestrials are already here? If I thought that extraterrestrials were really visiting the Earth, I wouldn't be doing this. None of us would be. Why, why would we go to all the trouble of building this very complex equipment and, and these expensive antenna arrays and so forth and so on if they were here? It's just not proven that any UFO is a spacecraft from another intelligent species. On the other hand, it must be said that we haven't shown that the extraterrestrials exist either. But we don't make the claim that we have. I think that's a big difference. We will only claim success when we really know we have found something extraterrestrial. If we claim something, there will be data to back it up. Doggone it, we're going to tell you it's up there at these coordinates in the sky. It's at this spot on the dial at this frequency. So take out your own antenna and go out and verify it. We would encourage you to verify it. OK, and that's 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 the difference between science and uh, myth making. When we come back, the making of a myth, the story of Roswell. For many of those who believe that the Earth has been visited by extraterrestrial spacecraft, this remote New Mexico ranch is hallowed ground. The story goes that it was here in the summer of 1947 that one of the greatest discoveries in human history was made. The holy grail of ufology, concrete evidence proving the existence of alien life. Major Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer at the Army Air Base in Roswell, receives a telephone call. The call is to go to the ranch of Mac Brazel and investigate some material that Brazel has found on his land. Marcel goes to the ranch and brings back a load of debris. And this stuff was extraordinary. Jesse Marcel was absolutely convinced that what he found was extraterrestrial, that the debris was nothing of this Earth. Marcel loaded up his car with the strange wreckage and drove the 75 miles to Roswell. He stopped at his home to show his wife and 11-year-old son, Jesse Jr., what he had found. Walked my mother and myself up saying, I want you to look at this. I mean, I can remember it just like it happened yesterday, uh, the type of material that was there. The most curious part of the debris that I saw were the I-beams, the uh, structural members with pinkish violet writing along the inside surface. It's more like geometric symbols. It was very impressive. Uh, when you see something that impressive, even as an 11-year-old, it stays with you. Jesse Marcel Sr. took the debris to the Army Air Force Base at Roswell early in the morning of July the 8th. And by noon, the base commander, Colonel William Blanchard, authorized a press release proclaiming that what Marcel had found was the remains of a flying saucer. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. 
Army officers say the missile has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Russia has there was a tremendous public excitement. I mean, the newspaper archives from that time, it was just all over the place. I mean, it was national news. It was a big deal. And people were very excited and very you know, frightened and everything else. For one moment in history, Roswell, New Mexico, could claim to be the only place on Earth where evidence existed that this planet was being visited by alien spacecraft. It was a short moment. The next day, there was a press conference, a press conference organized by General Roger Ramey. And Roger Ramey says, we did not recover a flying saucer. This is no flying disc. What we recovered was a weather balloon. The papers reported General Ramey empties Roswell's saucer. The Army Air Force reduced Marcel's discovery to nothing more than a harmless, high-altitude weather balloon. The public accepted it. There was, this was immediately in the wake of World War II, and I think most people basically trusted the government. And um, so, you know, they had no doubt that this was genuine, and this was true of the press as well. Uh, there was very little skepticism about it, and it just kind of went away. For 30 years, no one paid any attention to the events at Roswell. Jesse Marcel's story of a flying saucer that crashed might still be forgotten, were it not for a ufologist named Stanton Friedman. I got involved in 1978. I was at a television station in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The station manager, out of the blue, he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. He handled the wreckage of one of those saucers you were interested in when he was in the military. What? Stanton Friedman found Jesse Marcel. He was retired from the military and was a television repairman in Houma, Louisiana. Marcel had a story to tell. What I saw, I couldn't believe there was so much of it. It was scattered over such a vast area. We found a piece of metal about a foot, a foot and a half to two feet wide. You couldn't even bend it, you couldn't dead it. Even with a sledgehammer, it would bounce off of it. So it was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of. My dad finally came to the conclusion that this is a story that uh, should not be contained or buried. He felt it was time that people know the truth about this. But what is the truth? The wreckage hadn't been seen since 1947, so there was no way to prove Jesse Marcel's claims, which never stopped Stanton Friedman and his fellow Roswell promoters. The first Roswell book appeared in 1980. It said that what crashed was a flying saucer. It said there was no evidence because the government was hiding it somewhere. The government was engaged in a massive cover-up. If there has been a UFO cover-up, it began in Roswell, New Mexico. A persistent rumor holds that the United States government has recovered and is concealing fragments of alien spacecraft. Fragments and more. This all came together at a time when people were ready to buy into conspiracy. And then, you know, in 1989, Unsolved Mysteries did the recreation of the whole event, and off to the races we go. This Air Force base here in Roswell, New Mexico, was the center of a controversy back in 1947, but over 40 years later still remains unsolved. Jesse Marcel's story about a day long ago was becoming an article of faith and the promoters were busy spinning it every way they could. You think there was a government cover-up? Uh, there's no question about that, not only about this case, but lots of other UFO cases. After investigating for their new book, Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt are convinced it was a military cover-up. A parade of new witnesses came out of the woodwork to share the limelight with tales of secret government activity and alien bodies found in the wreckage. Good the small nose. Eyes like this. About how, how tall? About five, uh, five, three, five, four, somewhere as tall as that. Are you saying that yeah, extraterrestrials were found in Roswell? Yes, dead. Dead extraterrestrials were found, no question about it. This is an incredible story. Aliens, the federal government, intimidation, we have a bestseller on our hands.
The people who are promoting Roswell realize that there is a gold rush to Roswell. There is money to be made. But your book is only going to sell if your charges are more grandiose, more exaggerated, more powerful. So you have this ladder of escalation of sensationalism. In 1995, Fox Television broadcast what they promoted as recently discovered film of an alien autopsy performed at Roswell. It was seen by more than 20 million viewers. All right, I want to show you something. And then came the X-Files. This is a photo of a UFO that reportedly crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Jesse Marcel's unproven story was now primetime mythology. In Roswell, they captured aliens from the spacecraft wreckage. They salvaged various alien technology from them and from their data banks they learned of the alien plan to recolonize the Earth. Decades after something fell from the sky outside Roswell, this remote New Mexico town had hit the jackpot. It didn't matter that there wasn't a shred of evidence to support the claim that a flying saucer crashed here. It didn't matter that there were no credible witnesses to alien bodies. On the 50th anniversary of the alleged crash, 65% of Americans told a Time Magazine CNN poll that they believe the story. The myth, that is. The crowds come to celebrate the place where the truth about flying saucers and alien life was revealed. As for the strange debris itself... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In 1994 and 1997, in reports called The Roswell Incident and Case Solved, the Air Force offered its explanation. We're confident once the report is out and digested by the public that this will be the final word on the Roswell incident. The conclusion of the first report left no doubt that what was recovered near Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947 was debris from a formerly top secret Army Air Forces research project codename Mogul. Project Mogul was so secret it had the same security classification as the project to build the atomic bomb. These high-altitude balloons, with their instrumentation, were designed to detect Soviet nuclear tests. They were tremendous in size, as long as 650 feet. And in 1947, nothing else on Earth looked like this. When I began to look at the reports from that project, and see the kinds of materials that were used. Weather balloons, aluminum foil covered radar targets that had uh, struts that had funny little markings in purple and pink all over them. And then I took a look at the descriptions of the genuine debris that was found. It all matched. It all fit. So the irony of all of this is that the great Roswell mystery, the great Roswell cover-up, arose from a real cover-up, but the intent was not to protect knowledge of a crash-flying saucer, but to protect a very earthly project. To this day, Roswell's true believers dismiss everything the Air Force had to say. They believe the government cover-up continues. I think that Roswell has become an article of faith for many people. It happened, and that's all there is to it, and don't confuse me with the facts. I don't think that the hardcore believers will ever give up on Roswell. They cling to a myth, a myth that here outside Roswell in 1947, the question of are we alone was finally answered. It was not. If you were to go to a UFO convention and there are hundreds of them every year, you would likely find a lot of attention being paid to people who say they have been abducted by aliens. Reporting the UFO story is incomplete without this facet of it. However you judge the people you're about to hear, bear this in mind. The serious psychologists you will also meet tell us there's no reason to believe that your average abductee is any more psychiatrically impaired than the average person in the population. We're perfectly normal people. We're probably your coworkers your family or your friends, and we're having quite extraordinary experiences. And we're all trying to understand what's happening to us, who's doing it, and why. I had gone down to bed that night when four of these beings came into my house. 
and I was still awake laying down in my bed. I don't know where they came from or how, but they came in very fast into the room heading toward me. And then they were all down the side of my bed, four of them, again, um, to my right. I turned to face face them. I mean, I was I really literally thought I was going to die. The beings measured three feet eleven. They appeared very cold. It's really, really disturbing to be in a room with something that isn't supposed to exist. I was taken on the craft. I was brought to some very contained room. I can't talk about what was done there because it's too personal. It's just unbelievable. They're in my room. They're in the room. The two are on my left. Two on the left? Yeah, they're with me again. They're on my left. Mm -hmm, they're there. Bud Hopkins is an artist who spent the last 25 years exploring his belief that aliens are among us and have been abducting people. And what do they look like? Four foot tall, four and a half foot tall. Hopkins records story after story of people being taken onto spaceships and then returned to Earth with their memory clouded or erased. I can't even move. Mm -hmm. I can't even move. I'm trying to. As I've been working with um, abductees over the years, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, there seems to be no doubt that this has been going on for decades. Maybe not at the rate that it has been lately, but that n nobody knew who to report this to, and most people feel that it's just impossible that this could have happened to them. It is Hopkins who has convinced a large part of the UFO community that the phenomenon of abduction is real. I've been collecting drawings, sketches people have made of uh, what they remember inside craft and especially the faces of the aliens. I've been doing this for years and years since actually uh, starting probably 1975. Uh, of course, the enormous cranium is the, is the big feature. The mouth is very negligible, tiny, a slit. Bud Hopkins was the first. He published books and magazine articles, made public appearances, and then others followed. Abduction is now a common theme in movies and television. According to a Roper poll in 2002, one in five Americans believe that abductions have taken place. For the so-called abductees, the memories of what they say they have experienced are deeply traumatic. Most of the abduction experiences that I've had have been from my bed um, in the middle of the night. This is not all, however, the great majority. I'll be in bed and um, I will somehow sense fear, I'll sense something in the room, and at some point I can't move. I couldn't move my head left or right, but I could kind of look down at the foot of the bed and I saw people standing at the foot of my bed. I see these eyes, these eyes are just looking right through me. And then I don't remember anything. I woke up the following morning. The person may remember the beginning uh, of an experience and the ending, but they don't remember what happened in between. And uh, they're quite tormented by this. They come to me and we proceed with the investigation. In most cases, Hopkins uses hypnosis in what he says is a way to connect the person to memories that have allegedly been repressed. I was feeling comfortable, relaxed. Hypnosis has been extremely useful. When the person is physically relaxed, some of the static can be cleared away and the person has a clear recollection of what happened. You're in bed, one, this is a long time ago, we're just gonna see what it was. Two, right on the edge. Three. He's looking at me very closely. I'm saying he, but I don't know. It feels like a he. Yeah. One of the things, of course, that uh, caught my attention from the, from the very beginning was the similarity of these cases and the details that were coming up over and over again. Through hypnotic regression, I came to realize that there was a, a spaceship maybe 100 feet in the air off to the left of my front of my house. 
and the, an alien came in, was next to my next to my bed. It put its hand out, and I put my hand out. Sort of a chalky skin, um, very dry to, to the touch, and I don't really remember how, but suddenly we were sort of floating. They brought me in front of a being that was so horrifying that uh, I'll never be able to, you know, put it out of my memory. It was a very tall, probably about seven foot tall. I think very um, tall and very thin very and very scary and, and sometimes insect. almost um, like an insect, um, very frightening to me. And I found myself in this room and I was lying on this stretcher and this being, I, I don't even know how to say this, he started to put my legs apart. They put like a jock strap on you of some sort with a tube attached to it and it runs to a machine and they somehow extract sperm. I don't know how they do it. And this female brought a baby and, and she sort of handed him to me. And I instantly said, I, I, uh, this baby is mine. I know, I know he's mine. She pulled the baby away from me and said, no, this baby is ours. And five, you're starting to wake up. Four, waking up. Three, almost awake. Two, one, fully awake. I'm glad we did that. Yeah. We didn't know those things. Yeah. Bud has been looking at it for a long time, and I, I very much like his, um, his understanding of it and how he, ha he helps people. He's a good man. Hopkins' reliance on hypnosis to recover memories is challenged by professional psychologists. There is no evidence that hypnosis will help you retrieve memories, or if it does retrieve memories, that the memories that get retrieved are in fact accurate. What does happen under hypnosis is that you feel that the experience is real, or it lends credibility to what's emerging, but most likely what you're, um, what's emerging is the product of fantasy and of suggestion. Dr. Susan Clancy and other research psychologists at Harvard University who have worked with the abductees think that a common sleep disorder can explain much of the abduction experience. The subjects that we interview, when we ask them, how did this all begin? They described an experience that sounds strikingly like sleep paralysis. What happens is you wake up, usually it's in the middle of the night, and you feel terrified. You're paralyzed, um, overwhelmed with fear. People report feeling the presence, a presence of something in the room, or you might sort of see shapes or lights. It's a very common uh, experience. What happens in one of these episodes is that a person is emerging from rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, the stage of sleep when we do most of our dreaming. When we are in REM sleep, our entire body is paralyzed. It's probably a good thing, otherwise we'd act out our dreams. But in one of these episodes, what happens is that the person's eyes can open, they can see their bedroom, they're awake, they're conscious, and they're also aware that they're totally paralyzed. And suddenly they feel tingling sensations coursing through their body. They'll see lights flashing, sounds buzzing, and feel a sense of presence in the bedroom. If you don't know what this is, it can be a very frightening experience. These sorts of episodes have been reported throughout history and throughout cultures. The incubi, the succubi, the demons that used to visit people in the Middle Ages. But on our subjects, these visitors in the bedroom are interpreted as aliens. And finally, these individuals, our subjects, will often go to hypnotherapists, often who are believe in such things, and will then hypnotize them and do so-called regression sessions, where they'll take the person back to the moment where they were paralyzed in bed and try to find out what happened next. At that point, you get these quote-unquote memories emerging of being taken out of the bedroom, through the window, up into a spaceship, being experimented upon by these alien beings, participating in hybrid breeding and all sorts of other exotic adventures. And so... At this point, you've got yourself an alien abductee. The abductees reject any psychological explanation. They believe their experiences are real. You know, it's not some vague apparition or something. These guys were three-dimensionally in the room with me. What I remember is definitely real. It was very real to me. It, it's real. These people were moved and terrified and touched by their memories and what 
they believe happened to them, and uh, that's why they believe. I think if I had recovered a memory like that, I'd have a hard time disbelieving it, too. If this is real, it has to do with every single one of us, and we need to know more. I mean, there needs to be more questions asked, more. It's important. Because there is life in the universe, and we're babies, literally. Did you ever wonder what a civilization older than ours would look like, say a million years older than ours? The American astronomer Carl Sagan often wondered, and we wonder too, because with all this talk of aliens visiting us, they must have some extraordinary means of travel. Earth may be the cradle of mankind, but we haven't got very far beyond the cradle. Our technology just isn't up to it. The difficulty of going from star to star or of an alien spacecraft reaching here is simply not to be underestimated. Space travel is not just like the movies. Anybody who goes to the movies probably figures that interstellar travel is just a matter of having, you know, dilithium crystals and Scotty down in the engine room, and you can do it. It's borderline on the simulator, Captain. I cannot guarantee that she'll hold up. Warp drive, Mr. Scott. I don't mean to say that it's impossible to do it. I mean, it doesn't violate the laws of physics to go from one star system to another, but one shouldn't underestimate the difficulty of doing it simply because we see it done every night on television. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. It's more than just a technological problem. It, it's more than just building a better rocket. The distances are so vast. The energy requirements are so extreme, it would be very, very difficult to travel between the stars. It is a law of science determined by Einstein that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. The fastest object made by man ticks along at 11 miles per second. Voyager would take 73,000 years to reach the nearest star. Scientifically, we have a rule. You want to be alive at the end of your experiment, <laughs> not dead. So if you're going to be a part of a space expedition, you want to get there faster than your lifespan. I think the notion of transporting people, as some people think, to other planetary systems beyond the solar, our own solar system is so far beyond plausible reality that uh, it's a waste of time. And if we can't go there, many scientists tend to believe they can't come here. Some people slam the door on the question of other civilizations visiting the Earth because distances are so far away. I say, not so fast. ...and the final death of the universe. Dr. Michio Kaku is one of the leading theoretical physicists in the world. He is a professor at the City University of New York. Because in Einstein's theory, space and time is a fabric. The fundamental mistake people make when thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence is to assume that they're just like us, except a few hundred years more advanced. I say, open your mind, open your consciousness to the possibility that they are a million years ahead. A civilization that could harness the power of stars might be able to find a shortcut through space and time. Einstein said you cannot go faster than the speed of light. However, he left a loophole open. This is a wormhole. You know, in school, we learned that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. But actually, that's not true. You see, if you fold the sheet of paper and punch a hole through it, you begin to realize that a wormhole is the shortest distance between two points. Only those civilizations, millions of years ahead of ours, capable of harnessing the power of billions of star systems, have the ability, perhaps, to open gateways through space and time, to travel through portals, to go these enormous distances in a blink of an eye. A way, perhaps, for an alien vehicle to bridge the vastness of space. You simply cannot dismiss 
the possibility that some of these UFO sightings are actually sightings from some object created by an advanced civilization. A civilization far out in space, a civilization perhaps millions of years ahead of us in technology. You simply cannot discount that possibility. I have no idea where it was from. I just know that it was one unidentified and it was certainly flying. It was, it was a UFO for sure. My God, what did we just see? But we saw it, and when you see something of that sort, your life is never, ever the same. I mean, it is uh, like it just happened yesterday. I believe that the object that I saw was extraterrestrial. You can't even sleep because you're thinking, what in the world was it? What was it? And where it came from, when it came from, we do not know. I wish we did. When you look at this handful, handful of cases that cannot be easily dismissed. This is worthy. This is worthy of scientific investigation. Maybe there's nothing there. However, on that off chance that there is something there, that could literally change the course of human history. So I say, let this investigation begin. We have often wondered in the course of reporting on UFOs what we would do if we thought we saw one, who we'd share it with. Most people want to tell someone. Today, if you call the local Air Force Base or even the Federal Aviation Administration, they will tell you they don't investigate UFOs. But they may tell you to contact the National UFO Reporting Center. The center is in Seattle, Washington. It is a clearinghouse for thousands of eyewitness reports that come in every year. The National UFO Reporting Center is really one man, Peter Davenport, sitting alone at his desk in the corner of his living room. Davenport is the only person we met who devotes himself full time to collecting reports and investigating UFO sightings. This is the heart of the National UFO Reporting Center. A telephone, my trusty tape recorder, a uh, spare tape recorder if I need it, um, reference materials with regard to aircraft, and a website. That is UFO central, if you will, to coin a term. And as modest a facility, physically speaking, as modest as it is, we nevertheless can collect a lot of information. A lot of information from eyewitnesses to add to the already enormous record of sightings going back more than 50 years. Data that science ignores. The proper stance is one of skepticism. Because what we ufologists are saying is that the planet Earth is being visited on a regular basis. Perhaps on a daily basis. There goes that line. National UFO Reporting Center, good evening. My name is Dr. Scott Crawford. I'm calling from Miami, Florida. I'm an amateur astronomer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just outside my backyard. Mm -hmm. I saw an object move from east to west over Miami. How long did you see it, please? About 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Right. National uh, UFO Reporting uh, Center, good big evening. White. It was like a, oh, a yeah, a big ball of white light, and behind it was like but this orange flame stuff. Like in the front shot of four five windows. <laughs> very bright lights and I thought probably someone was looking out the windows mm -hmm. okay no lights blue, no noise green. I'm gonna guess it was going a thousand miles an hour or faster I, you know, I really don't round know. Spaceship. more than 50 years after Kenneth Arnold saw the first flying saucers it is left to Peter Davenport and only a few others to investigate this mystery it changed directions mm -hmm. twice Every day, seven days a week, Davenport talks to people, sometimes dozens of people who have seen an object in the sky. People for whom seeing is now believing. Thank you very much. Good night. Wow, this was a good one. We're still hoping to find that golden nugget that will make our position incontrovertible, namely the fact that it appears that these things that we call UFOs are visiting the planet Earth. The golden nugget of ufology, something to elevate ufology to more than a shadow of mainstream science, to convince the skeptics 
that UFOs are more than just lights in the sky. Ultimately, the UFO believers and the scientists have one thing in common. They dream of the day that there will be contact with extraterrestrials. Ultimately, only contact is going to resolve the mystery. It has been a very interesting journey. I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us. Good night. I've always believed that there could be something else. I just believe we're not the only ones in the universe. I believe that there is other intelligences. I know UFOs exist because I've seen them. People say, oh, it was 600 meters wide. How do you know? <laughs> it's in the sky. It's dark. What are you talking about? They can't bring forth that one good case. I keep asking. I think they're probably out there somewhere in the universe. But I don't think they're hovering around Earth probing people. I just don't think it's they're bothering us at all. I know entities from elsewhere, who knows where, exist because I've been in contact with them. It's very straightforward. If you just come in with a, with a, you know, a seat cushion from a UFO, you know, or a piece of the wheel assembly or even a ballpoint pen from their dashboard, just something. There's been no explanation for what we saw that night. So it just hangs out there as one of the big question marks. 